data. You might not know why it's important, but you know it is. Whether it's your boss telling you to be more data-driven, or it's your professors telling you that data is the new black gold, data is the center of everything we do today. Here's 101 terms in 30 minutes to give you an overview of the data world from data science to data analytics to data engineering. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you find this useful. Let's start by defining data. In data science, data refers to any information that can be represented in the form of numbers and therefore understood by computers. This includes actual numbers, text, photos, sounds, and many other forms of data. When a computer stores data, it needs to be structured in some way. When you can structure your data in the form of a two-dimensional table, it's called structured data. Think about something that can fit in a Microsoft Excel sheet. CSVs are a common way of storing structured data. It stands for Comma Separated Values. When you open one in your computer, it'll typically open in Microsoft Excel or another spreadsheeting program. If you right click and open it in a text editor, then you'll see that each value is separated by a comma and each line is separated by something we'd call a line break. Semi-structured data is data that is stored in a tagged hierarchical format that doesn't easily fit into a tabular or structured format. JSON is a common way of storing semi-structured data. It stands for JavaScript object notation and stores values in a key value structure. This format allows you to store complicated data, like data which has multiple values per key, or data which needs to be stored in some kind of hierarchical format. Unstructured data is data that can't be easily represented in a structured or semi-structured format. This can include things like photo, audio, or social media posts. As the tools to analyze data get better and more advanced, the ability to analyze unstructured data is becoming a more important part of a data professional's toolkit. Let's say you want to break into the world of data. What can you do? There are many careers in the world of data, one of the most in-demand and lucrative being a data engineer. A data engineer is a conductor that ensures that data from many different sources comes together gracefully in a symphony that is clean, error-free, and computationally efficient. To get an idea of how much data is created and why we need specialized professionals to manage it, let's take the example of the NFL, America's Gridiron Football League. When a fan buys a ticket, they generate a record with information like the seat number, time the ticket was bought, etc. When they go to the game, parking bought, the time the ticket was scanned in, the number of concessions bought, apparel bought, and maybe even facial tracking are all data points that are collected. There are probably hundreds of megabytes of data generated per person daily at major events. When multiplied by the hundreds of thousands of people attending, you can start to see how managing all this data requires people with specialized skills in managing large amounts of data across a series of disconnected systems. At their core, data engineers ensure that this data is efficiently brought together for data scientists and data analysts to analyze. Now, as some of you may know, I recently transitioned from a role as a senior data analyst into a role as a senior data engineer. And the transition has been very interesting, especially because the skills between data analysts and data engineers differ quite a bit. But that transition has been made easier by this week's sponsor, ProjectPro.io. ProjectPro.io is the premier source to get fully done end-to-end -end projects on any subject in data that you are interested in. I always like to say that the best way to prepare for a job is to start doing it before you're actually doing it. And ProjectPro.io has projects just for you. End-to-end -end projects for data analysts, data scientists, or data engineers. Or if you are a professional working in the field, they will teach you and they have recipes that will show you how to actually do real-life tasks from end-to-end -end using real-life tools. Everything from Databricks to Snowflake to AWS to GCP. Whether you're a seasoned professional looking for some recipes for an actual problem you're trying to solve at work, or you're a student or someone else looking to break into the industry and looking for something for your portfolio, ProjectPro.io has projects for data scientists, data engineers, and data analysts. They've been a great sponsor of this channel, and I've loved working with them over the past couple of months. Support this channel by supporting our sponsors, ProjectPro.io. Check it out in the link in the description below. All the data you created at the football game, it has to be stored somewhere. Databases are the computer systems that corporations use to store organized data in all formats. The most popular form of database is probably the relational database, which is controlled by something called a relational database management system. For the most part, a relational database only stores structured data and separates its data into tables, which are related to one another through their columns. One of the most useful aspects of relational databases, and a reason they're probably the most popular database format in the world, is that they are often ACID compliant, meaning that transactions within the database are atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. Atomic meaning each transaction, read and write, is treated as a separate unit, either the entire transaction is executed or it isn't. This protects against data loss and corruption, either the transaction succeeded or it doesn't. Consistent, 
Transactions are made in predefined and predictable ways. If something in your data is corrupted, unintended errors in your table won't occur. Isolated. Multiple users reading and writing simultaneously will have their transactions isolated from one another, ensuring concurrent transactions can happen without interference. And durable. Even if the system fails, transactions will be saved. If you need to store important data like customer balances because you're a bank, a relational database helps ensure data integrity because of its ACID compliance. Another great aspect of relational databases is the prevalence of SQL or SQL, a querying language that's easy to learn, difficult to read, and impossible to master. This is how data professionals oftentimes interact with databases and is a core skill for anyone who wants to break into the world of data science. I have a one hour tutorial on SQL if you want to get started. Usually when you have a table in SQL, you don't need all of the data in that table at the same time. When you want to limit the amount of data you're bringing in, you can use the select statement to limit the number of columns that you bring in from a full table, or you can use the where statement to limit the number of rows you're going to bring in based on some condition or a series of conditions. After you filter down your data, you might want to aggregate said data. Aggregating data is all about taking a certain number of rows and combining the data in such a way that you end up with less data than before. One common way to aggregate data is to sum or average it. Depending on your RDBMS, you can have dozens of other ways to aggregate your data. A common issue is that the data you need is separated into multiple tables. There are two main ways to combine data from multiple tables, unions and joins. A union refers to joining tables vertically, or basically stacking tables on top of one another. A join refers to combining tables horizontally by matching values in common columns from both tables. While relational databases are great if your data comes in formats that are tabular, if you have semi-structured or unstructured data, you'll want to store it in a NoSQL database. This refers to a group of database paradigms that rose out of the need for internet companies like YouTube and Facebook to store massive amounts of data in a relatively cheap way. NoSQL databases are usually not ACID compliant, but can scale to handle massive amounts of traffic better than many SQL databases can. MongoDB is probably the most common NoSQL database out there, although there are many others like Amazon's DynamoDB or Microsoft's Cosmos DB. So far, we've talked about the software management of databases, but also important is the physical computer a database is on. Databases are stored and processed on servers, which are basically computers that are designed to handle massive amounts of traffic. Back in the Stone Age, you would have to buy, power, and manage these servers yourself if you were a large company. These databases were considered on-premise or on-prem databases. In data professions, you'll often hear about a database being on-prem or needing to move data from on-prem. If you're moving data from on-prem, you're usually moving it to the cloud. Cloud services are a group of services managed by a large company who takes care of everything from buying and powering the servers to managing physical security to adding and subtracting server power based on how much traffic you have. When using cloud outside of China, the big players are Amazon Web Services, better known as AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud Platform, otherwise known as GCP. AWS started off in the early 2000s and is the current market leader with Azure behind it and GCP behind Azure. If you're in China and somehow are able to watch this video, then Alibaba Cloud, Tencent Cloud, and Huawei Cloud are some of the biggest players. Modern clouds have been a breeding ground for companies who base their entire existence on the major cloud services. Snowflake is probably the most famous of these companies and built their entire data warehouse tool on top of AWS. A data warehouse is just a database that companies store and organize large amounts of data away from their production systems or systems that actually run business processes so that it can be analyzed by data professionals. A store, for example, will have a data warehouse like Snowflake, which has a copy of all of the customer transactions data for analysis separate of the actual data which is used to run business operations. Additionally, data warehouses usually have the ability to run extremely complicated transactions and calculations, which makes them perfect for analytical purposes. If you work in data today, you'll inevitably run into big data. Big data is a bit of an amorphous term, and if you post anything about big data onto a website frequented by tech professionals, you'll constantly be told that you're not actually working with big data. Ignoring the haters, big data has three main parts to it, high volume, high velocity, and high variety. Big data emerged out of the exponential increase in computational systems over the past few decades. Between all the interactions that computers have with each other, petabytes of data are created constantly. Before we talk about how we solve the problems of dealing with big data, we must first talk about vertical versus horizontal scaling. Let's say you need to store and process a bunch of data. You'll need two things, computational power or compute and storage space. You could vertically scale your system, which means you buy a more capable system with more storage and a stronger processor. At the individual level, this works relatively well. When you need to process more data on your laptop, you buy a more expensive laptop. This method does not scale very well for large operations though. Instead, it's cheaper to just buy more cheaper systems, usually called commodity hardware, and write software that distributes the files and computation leads across multiple computers. This is called horizontally scaling and is basically how we deal with all big data problems. Going through each of the aspects of big data one by one, let's talk about how we deal with the massive volume of data today. 
One of the most common ways of storing massive amounts of data is to use something called object storage. Object storage is a form of storage that allows you to just dump a file into a sectioned off part of a disk and then gives that file a key which you can use to retrieve it later. This allows us to create massive data lakes which can store insane amounts of data relatively cheaply to deal with the insane data volume of the modern world. Back before the era of big data, the velocity at which we had to move data didn't need to be that fast except for the most advanced use cases. This led companies to process data in batches, maybe once a day or once a week. This allowed them to run data processes when fewer people would use systems and overall requires simpler data infrastructure to set up. One modern example of batch data processing is the ACH system that direct deposits your paycheck into your bank account. As the use cases of data and the volume of data grew, so did the justification for ingesting data in real time. Let's say you want to dynamically offer deals to customers based on their behavior in your app. You could have the app have rules that trigger whenever the customer does something. This works but isn't very dynamic. Let's say you want to dynamically offer a deal to the customer based on what they do in an app. We'll need to stream in the data from millions of users we have to our systems using a streaming data pipeline, process it, and then port the result back to the user. Streaming data processing also allows for real-time analytics. One common framework used to deal with streaming data is the Apache Kafka framework created by LinkedIn. When you have a large variety of data coming in from different systems that has to go to another large variety of systems, the number of connections that you have to make scales too fast for you to manage them. This is where Kafka comes in. Kafka is a high throughput messaging system that takes in all of the data from your input systems and coordinates their transportation to the output systems. A great example of Kafka's use in the real world is how Netflix uses it to recommend shows to you in real time. After we have somewhere to store our data and stream it, we'll need the ability to process a large variety of said data. Dealing with the massive velocity of data requires more interesting solutions. Dealing with this massive amount of data requires a big data framework that can horizontally scale the computational power available to us and intelligently distribute the load across these systems. Apache Hadoop, inspired by work at Google, was one of the first extremely popular frameworks to do this. It allows for the processing of massive amounts of data using distributed computing, meaning it will distribute the computations across many different computers and coordinate the results to come up with a solution that's similar to if one computer did everything by itself. Apache Spark, developed in Berkeley, came out eight years later and did basically the same thing but was designed to counteract the deficiencies of Hadoop and tended to be faster because it would use RAM to store intermediate operations instead of disk space like Hadoop. This also means it can be more expensive to run. You're probably now wondering why all these tools have Apache at the beginning of them and what Apache is. Is it some super data company that's creating all these industry standard tools? Not quite. It's an open source community of volunteers who manage a lot of the software tools that undergird modern technological infrastructure. Oftentimes, people who create software that has a lot of generalized use cases will turn over the software to the Apache Foundation, which will then apply the Apache license to it, which allows the software to be used and modified for just about any purpose. Now the question is, what is open source software? Open source software is software that can be freely used or modified for basically any purpose, including commercial. Open source software has become such a common paradigm for releasing software that major tech companies like Google and Facebook are constantly releasing incredibly complicated data tools for free. This essentially allows them to kick innovation on certain projects into high gear and has been a very core part of tech culture since the turn of the century. Even Microsoft went from openly bashing Linux to being one of the biggest contributors to open source projects over the last two decades. Pivoting from data engineers, another profession in the world of data is the data scientist. Data scientists often focus on the complicated problems a company might have that can be solved with deep and computationally or mathematically intensive analysis of data. Oftentimes, a data scientist will work on a very complicated problem where data is not easily available for over the course of multiple weeks or months and use tools from coding to mathematics to try and estimate an answer for a previously unanswerable question. One of the most important tools in the tool belt of the data scientist is the ability to program. The languages of choice for most data scientists are R and Python. Python is a general purpose programming language that is valued for its clean syntax, very robust selection of add-ons, also called libraries, and its open source nature. R is the other popular programming language for data scientists. It's very popular amongst people with very strong academic backgrounds, or people who have had the misfortune of suffering through SAS, MATLAB, or STATA. If you are starting from scratch, I recommend that you learn Python instead of R because more jobs are available to Python programmers. An ancient art form discovered by software engineers eons ago, but still not widely adopted by the data community. In all seriousness, version control is a system that allows people who write code to have multiple versions of it, which can be tested automatically for bugs prior to launching. It helps large teams work together in an error-free and integrated manner. GitHub and GitLab are probably the biggest names in the world of version control software. Version control only works if you have code written first. While software engineers write code on blank canvases, data scientists will oftentimes use code sectioned off into blocks 
For Python users, this is a Jupyter Notebook. For R users, this is the R Markdown file. These file formats allow you to write and run code iteratively and work well for data scientists as the work of analyzing data is an extremely iterative process. When working on a data science project in Python or R, you'll almost always need access to extra software in the form of software libraries. These libraries are installed using a package manager like pip for Python or CRAN for R. There are even specialized package managers that are used for data science. One of the most popular packages that you will work with as a data scientist is the NumPy package. You might have heard that Python is considered a slow language. One way to fix this is the solution that NumPy has pursued, which is to pre-compile C code in a nice, clean Python wrapper. Essentially, this means that you're writing in Python, but executing C. NumPy is a library that allows us to perform all kinds of array operations that are necessary to perform data science quickly. An array is just a collection of objects, generally of the same type. Data frames are a commonly used feature for data scientists and basically the programming equivalent of tabular data. Data frames can have multiple indices that can be layered in pretty interesting ways. The library that adds data frame functionality to Python is Pandas, which is short for panel data. Like a lot of stuff in the world of data science, Pandas is an invention of the financial industry. It allows you to import, read, clean, analyze, and export data using a very simple set of commands. Pandas is the starting point for a lot of data science projects as a data scientist tries to get an understanding of their data. SciPy is a fun library that has lots of features that are useful for scientific computing. It can help solve optimization problems, linear algebra, integration, and interpolation. If you don't understand what any of this means, don't worry, I barely do too. If you're wondering why I haven't mentioned the equivalent packages in R, it's because they're all conveniently combined into a single library called the Tidyverse. After you learn your basic analyses as a data scientist, you might want to create some machine learning algorithms. To that end, scikit-learn has become the standard library in Python to accomplish this. If you've heard about data science, then you've heard about machine learning as well. From email spam filters to speech recognition, to that robot that beat that guy at that game I used to watch an anime about, machine learning as a field has exploded in use over the last 15 years. It is a field dedicated to programming machines to teach themselves how to become better at a task after learning with some data. Although jumping straight into machine learning sounds like an excellent idea, the best data scientists oftentimes have a method to their madness and will tackle problems procedurally. One such procedure is CRISP-DM, or the Cross-Industry Standard Process for Data Mining. It was created by IBM in the 90s, back when data science was still called data mining, but still holds up quite well as a framework to tackle many data science problems. The first step is to gain a business understanding, which is essentially an understanding of the requirements of the analysis you need to conduct. What are you trying to accomplish? Data understanding comes right after and is about understanding if you have the data necessary to deliver on the requirements of the business. If not, then you need to go back to the business requirements and either simplify the goal or find a way to acquire necessary data. One important way to understand the data you're working with is to perform EDA or exploratory data analysis. This usually means taking statistics of your data, checking if there are any missing values, and overall measuring the data quantitatively and qualitatively to fully understand it and if it will help you solve your business question. After an agreement on a realistic business goal and its associated data has been reached, you'll go to the data pre-processing step. Data science follows the philosophy of GIGO, garbage in, garbage out. If the data you use in your models is bad or dirty, i.e. they have missing values, they aren't accurate, they don't represent the population that you want to analyze, you'll spend all your time building machine learning models or analyzing data that won't yield anything useful to achieve your business goals. This step is oftentimes the most time-consuming one, but where you'll really appreciate taking your time as it will save you heartache further down. In cleaning this data, you'll have access to a lot of data. If we think of our data in a tabular format, each row refers to an instance of the data. Each column refers to a feature of the data. Imputation is a data preprocessing technique where we try and estimate the value of missing values in our data through the data surrounding. The most common methods involve just replacing the data with our mean or median of the feature. More advanced methods of imputation involve training machine learning algorithms to predict what each missing value should be, MLception style. Machine learning algorithms, like the computers that power them, can only truly understand numbers. What do you do when you have data that doesn't consist just numbers? Encoding is a step you'll have to perform to turn categorical data into numerical data, usually by mapping it to some number. The whole point of data preprocessing is to make your data work better with machine learning algorithms. So far, we've just talked about techniques to make data intelligible to the computer. Data preprocessing also includes techniques used to improve the predictive ability of your data. You can use feature engineering to manipulate or combine features to try and create better predictors for your data. Feature engineering is as much of an art as it is a science and is greatly helped with the knowledge of the business domain you're working in. One important step in the data preprocessing pipeline is the train test split. The train test split refers to the step where we split our data into at least two sections, one called the training data set and one called the testing data set. A machine learning algorithm will oftentimes perform thousands if not millions of operations on a data set to try and learn more about it. Once it has learned what it can about a data set, it will then spit out some predicted value. 
We need some way to tell if the values output from the algorithm are actually accurate. We could, of course, compare the predicted values to the actual values from the same data set, but all this tells us is how accurately the algorithm performs with this data set. This is where we sick our algorithm out on the test data set, a data set it's never seen before. This helps us determine the actual predictive power of our algorithm. After we have prepared our data, we get to the modeling step, which is what data science is most well known for. This is the step where we actually build our machine learning model and is generally considered the most fun part of the data science process. When creating our algorithm, we'll train it, meaning we'll show it our training data and have the algorithm iterate over it, hopefully learning something new at every iteration. The process of actually looking for patterns in the data is called fitting, as in we fit the algorithm to our data. You might have heard that machine learning algorithms are quite complicated and require a lot of computational power to execute. This is because of both the massive amount of data that is often used to train these models and the complexity of the algorithms used to train them. Graphics processing units, or GPUs, were originally created to perform large numbers of complicated mathematical computations, one after another to help compute graphics. Turns out they're very good for training machine learning algorithms as well. As machine learning became more integral to the operations and products of big tech companies, they built more and more specialized hardware to train more complicated algorithms. TPUs are an invention of Google and stand for Tensor Processing Unit. TPUs are even better at performing mathematical operations for certain types of ML algorithms than GPUs. After you train an algorithm, you might find that it isn't as accurate as you'd hoped. This is where hyperparameter tuning can come in handy. Hyperparameters are the parameters or settings that control the way an algorithm is trained. It's one way that you can improve the performance of a model. Let's say you don't have access to the complicated hardware sometimes required to train certain algorithms. This is where techniques like dimensionality reduction can be useful. These algorithms attempt to find dense patterns in your data that can be grouped together and remove features or combine features such that you reduce the overall number of features you're working with, thereby reducing the dimensions to your data. All that sounded pretty cool, right? Well, you can see why modeling is the most popular step of CRISPDM. After building our model, we need to evaluate it against the business requirements originally laid out. If we find that the project has not solved our business requirements, then it's time to go back to step one to see where we need to adjust our business goals if we don't have the data required to solve the project. Assuming we pass evaluation, we will eventually want to deploy our model, which means it will be released into the real world to solve whatever issue it was created to solve. Coming back to the path of machine learning after that long tangent, assuming we're in the modeling section of CRISPDM, it's now time for us to determine which machine learning model we're going to use. First, we need to determine if the problem we're going to solve is a supervised, unsupervised, or reinforcement problem. A supervised problem is one where we train a machine learning model on a target variable of some kind with data that we might have. A target variable is the variable that we'd like to predict. It can be something like whether a photo is a hot dog or not a hot dog, or trying to predict incomes in a population based on some data we have of said population. If you've decided that your problem is a supervised problem, you'll then need to decide if you want to solve it using regression or classification. You use regression if your target variable is numeric, and you use classification otherwise. For example, if you want to predict incomes based on a series of factors, incomes are numeric. So you'd be solving a supervised regression problem. This. A support vector machine algorithm is one of the most common algorithms in machine learning and works by trying to find the biggest gap between various groups inside a data set. If your target variable is not numeric, then you have a supervised classification problem. When working with classification problems, you have a couple of ways you can classify objects. Binary classification is just classifying if based on some data, an object is one thing or another, such as a hot dog or not a hot dog. Multi-label classification is another type of classification where we can classify each instance with multiple labels. This could be something like predicting the make and model of a car bought by individuals based on a bunch of information we know about their other buying habits. The confusingly named logistic regression is just one such type of classification algorithm. Unsupervised algorithms won't try and match your data to a target variable. Instead, they'll try and find their own patterns in the data. This is useful if you want to cluster your data. Clustering is an unsupervised technique where your algorithm will try to cluster observations into groups based on how related instances are to one another. Let's say we have a table of people's transaction data for a certain store. A clustering algorithm can create groups of customers with similar purchasing habits, which you can then label with archetypes to better target certain particularly desirable customers. Although now commonly used to refer to the excellent podcast Ken's Nearest Neighbors, KNN refers to an algorithm called K Nearest Neighbors. Basically, you define what K should be, and the algorithm will create centers in your data and group the nearest K values to each other. Although easiest to illustrate with two-dimensional data, this technique works with data of all dimensions. Reinforcement learning is a very special type of machine learning algorithm that tries to teach by setting some desired outcome and rewarding the algorithm when that outcome is reached and punishing it if the outcome isn't reached. For a particularly interesting example, check out this video by Two Minute Papers, where a reinforcement learning algorithm is used to train bots to play hide and seek. As they let the algorithm run for longer, the results start to get very interesting. A really versatile yet common algorithm that tries to create a tree of decision nodes to classify values into different categories. 
it uses a metric such as information gain to determine how to split each decision node into two different routes. Decision trees are great because they're relatively simple to explain, quick to train, and yet fairly accurate. There are many different categories of machine learning algorithms. The most effective algorithms these days are ones that fall into the ensemble category. Ensemble methods will try and combine the predictions of multiple algorithms to create one super algorithm. One of the simplest but most popular ensemble algorithms is the random forest. It works by training multiple decision trees to try and predict an outcome. They have similar benefits to decision trees in that they're easy to implement, pretty good predictors, and easy to explain. A neural network is a group of machine learning models that work really well with tasks such as image recognition and speech recognition. They work in a manner that is reminiscent of the human brain using individual nodes, each which represents a variable. Each node can be represented with a linear equation that takes the input and creates a new number, which is then passed through the channels to the next layer. At this layer, we can then do the same thing, and if the number of each node outputs passes a predetermined threshold, then the node is considered activated and passes its value to the next layer. We do this until we get to the end where the network outputs probabilities of an object being of each class, for example. After checking if the answer is correct, the network will backpropagate through the network, correcting weights and biases of nodes until it eventually gets to the right category. Although that might sound very complicated, the actual implementation of neural networks is fairly simple with most people using PyTorch or TensorFlow libraries created by Meta and Google respectively. One major problem that neural networks have is that they can take a long time to train. Oftentimes, they need specialized hardware and need a lot of data to be trained accurately. Boosting algorithms are based off the idea that weak ML algorithms, ones which don't do a great job of predicting, can be strategically combined in order to make a strong predictor. Basically, if you train enough machine learning algorithms and find out what each one is good at predicting, combine everything together, you'll come up with a single strong algorithm. Like I mentioned above, a lot more complicated algorithms like neural networks require a lot of computing power to train well. Instead of getting more and more powerful laptops that might only be useful for a few years and might not even be used at full power all the time, solutions like Databricks exist to help you train your machine learning algorithms in the cloud. Using their GPUs and big data frameworks, you can work with massive amounts of data without having to buy any expensive hardware for yourself. Just because you've trained your model doesn't mean you're done. As new data is introduced to a system or conditions change, machine learning models experience something called model drift, which causes the model to become worse at predicting things over time. One really common instance of this is with models that are used to predict the stock market. As conditions change, the old algorithms that used to work well tend not to work as well. Now we get to the forgotten stepchild of data science, statistics. When you're working with data, you'll often want to use numbers to somehow describe it. Descriptive statistics are a great way to do this and involve taking measures of central tendency like mean, median, mode of a data set's columns along with standard deviation, value counts, etc. Basically, any way you can use numbers to describe the data. Inferential statistics are when statistics start to get really interesting, as this is where you use stats to try and determine information about the data that isn't explicitly said. Things like forecasting future results and generalizing a population based on a sample fall into this bucket. Bayesian statistics, or Bayesian thinking, is a field of statistics that concerns itself with the likelihood of an event happening given other events have happened. A great example would be trying to figure out the likelihood that someone you're going to go on a first date with likes Star Wars. Your estimate is that about 60% of the population likes Star Wars. While on this date, it comes out that your date went to go see the last Star Wars movie. You know that basically all fans of Star Wars saw the movie, but not everyone who saw the movie was a Star Wars fan. And you can update your hypothesis to say it's 80% likely that your date is a Star Wars fan. A data distribution describes how data, usually numerically, is distributed. The most common type of distribution is the Gaussian or normal distribution, which is a precondition for running a lot of statistical tests. One really important statistical concept that can affect the accuracy of your machine learning algorithms is selection bias. This is a type of bias introduced when individuals or instances selected for groups are not truly randomized, which can lead to poor accuracy in your algorithms. An example would be if your train test split was done poorly, such that your training group is not generally representative of your entire sample. Bootstrapping is one way to fight this type of bias and also try and make your algorithms work when you don't have that much data to work with. Bootstrapping is a procedure when you select a random sample, replace all the items in the sample, and then sample again. Hypothesis testing in statistics is a way for you to test the results of a survey or experiment to see if you have meaningful results. You're basically testing whether your results are valid by figuring out the odds that your results have happened by chance. If your results may have happened by chance, the experiment won't be repeatable, so it has little use. This is very useful for data scientists who want to generalize over a population whether something that they've done is effective or not. If you want to break into the world of data science, becoming a data analyst is a great way to get started. It was my first job and taught me a lot of the skills that eventually got me into data science in a more delicate manner than diving straight into hardcore data science. A data analyst will generally work with business leaders to understand their needs in a process called requirements gathering, check if the data is available, analyze, and present it to said business leaders. 
At the end of the day, a data analyst is involved in the practice of data storytelling. What's the point of analyzing data? It is to drive some form of change in an organization or group of people. While you can inundate people with numbers, facts, and figures, you're much more likely to convert people to your method of thinking if you can tell them a story that communicates the message using data. There are seven different data stories that you can tell. Narrate change over time. An example of this could be a time lapse of the Amazon being deforested over time. Start big and drill down. This is a great way to give context to the smaller data points you want to communicate. If you wanted to communicate how infrastructurally underdeveloped North Korea is, you could show a map of all of Asia and how well lit it is at night, then zoom into the one part that isn't, North Korea. Start small and zoom out. This is the method a lot of news outlets will use when discussing an issue. They'll find an individual affected by the issue to anchor the audience with a sympathetic person, and then zoom out to explain how the problem affects a much larger population. Highlight contrasts. This is a great way of showing how problem areas tend to cluster around one another. If we looked at an index of free nations, you'll notice that a lot of nations that are not free tend to cluster around certain regions of the world compared to other free nations. Explore the intersection. This can be how different phenomena develop in response to stimuli in their environment. A line graph of North Korean GDP per capita versus South Korean GDP per capita shows an intersection in the 1950s followed by a huge acceleration of South Korea to the stratosphere while North Korea eventually suffers. Dissect the factors. Oftentimes, we want to know what are the constituent parts of an observed phenomena. Let's take global GDP figures. By itself, there is not much of a story here. But as we dissect them by country, you start to see the rise of certain countries during different times in history. Profile the outliers. Sometimes the outliers are what we're truly interested in. If you're working in fraud detection, normal transactions are not something you're interested in as much as the outliers are. Business intelligence is concerned with using generally tabular data and transforming and visualizing it in order to explain business performance. It's less about analyzing the data, like a data analyst does, and more about communicating what the data says in formats that help leaders understand how the business is performing. Business intelligence professionals use a class of tools called BI tools. These are tools with graphical user interfaces that connect them to many different sources of data and make visualizing them easy. If you're trying to create a visualization in Python, you'll use matplotlib or seaborn or ggplot2 if you use R. There are many different ways to visualize data, one of the most common being a scatter. Scatter plots are commonly used to visualize the relationship between two or more variables. You can even create a four-dimensional scatter plot by giving each point in a three-dimensional scatter plot a color. Bar charts are a staple of data visualization and are a great default chart to use because they're very familiar to most people and easy for people to read. Most people display their charts in a vertical bar chart. I would actually suggest going for the horizontal bar chart as most people read right to left, top to bottom. The horizontal bar chart preserves the natural order of reading and makes it easier to compare classes to one another. Pie charts are a chart type that should almost never be used. If you have more than three very differently sized groups, then it'll become very difficult for your audience to differentiate the group. Pie chart slices are differentiated based on the volume of each slice. Volumes are very different for the human eye to compare across different categories. This is in opposition to lengths, which are what we need to compare the different categories in a bar chart. I would actually suggest that you switch pie charts to horizontal bar charts. That way your data is communicated in a more consistent and easy to read manner. Line graphs are an excellent way to show change over time. Just be careful, as the fact that the lines have no breaks in them implies that the data is continuous, as in something is happening between the points on the chart. Time series data is a very common data type used to graph line graphs. It is any data with a date and time in one column, and generally a numeric value in another column. Tree maps are a fun graph type that can highlight the biggest categories in a complex system. They're often used to map out the sectors of a nation's economy, for example. A histogram is a special bar chart that groups the values in a single group in buckets that are represented by columns. It's used to illustrate how data is distributed. The chloropleth map is a great way to illustrate the differences in geographic areas. It's a very powerful map type and used a lot to illustrate the difference in populations. Radar charts are a great way of comparing multiple quantitative variables against one another and really highlighting the outliers that might be there. And finally, 101 ultra wide monitors, a great way to annoy people on Zoom calls whenever you share your screen by making your text way too small to read, but the perfect size for you. You can't be taken seriously as a data professional if you don't have one of these.